What the heck? New research, testosterone in the colon? Like seriously, in our colon? We have 70 times more DHT in our colon than anywhere else in the body? What, what is going on with this? There are a lot of reasons to be making sure you have a diverse microbiome. Okay, I am no stranger to that. If you are a veteran of this channel, you probably see the content I talk about all the time, preaching diversity in the gut microbiome, diversity in the microbiome. But when we're looking at the big picture and like individual things, it's very interesting to see what a role it might be playing. Now, originally I had learned about this when I was doing a topic surrounding lower carb protocols and testosterone and came across this research. I'm like, whoa, okay, this is earth shattering stuff. So there was a study that was published in the Journal of Research Microbiology that caught my attention. Okay, it divided people into three groups, a low testosterone group, a medium testosterone group, and a high testosterone group. And then they looked at their gut diversity, like their microbiome diversity. And it was pretty clear that the more diverse the microbiome was, the higher the levels of testosterone were. And you know, the other direction too, low diversity, lower testosterone. That does not mean that correlation equals causation. That is not enough grounds by any means to make a statement on that. But it got me really interested and really thinking about it. Because when you look at people that eat a wide variety of foods, a lot of times like you look at the rate of just reproduction and how it works and fertility and it usually is a little bit improved as well. So anyhow, let's take a look at another study that might explain the whole testosterone piece. Okay, this was studied in the journal Physiology, Endocrinology and Metabolism. And what this study found was that we had 70 times the amount of dihydrotestosterone, DHT, in our colon than in our plasma. Now let me just give you a little bit of context as to what this is, okay? Dihydrotestosterone, or DHT, is the very sensitive version of testosterone. Okay, I mean, just to make it simple. Basically what happens is we have androgen receptors within our body, and these receptors are what are important. In fact, if you look at studies, you find that testosterone matters, but not nearly as much as the amount of testosterone that's actually hitting the androgen receptor. So let me just paint a picture. If you were to take two groups of people, one with relatively low testosterone and one with relatively high testosterone, you put them on a weight training regime and you, you know, had them eat the same amount of foods, it doesn't necessarily mean that the person with the higher levels of testosterone is going to build more muscle. In fact, some studies have seen that's not the case. It has to do with your androgen receptor sensitivity like how much your androgen receptors that receive those things, receive the testosterone, receive the DHT, how effective and sensitive they are. So in essence, someone with moderately lower testosterone could actually have a better outcome at the receptor level than someone with really high testosterone if they had just poor outcomes at the receptor level. So DHT is important because DHT has a very strong affinity for the androgen receptors. Okay, so much so that the testosterone that is in our testes as men, a lot of times gets converted into DHT simply for that reason, because it has twice the affinity for that receptor. Now, a lot of this is somewhat speculative, okay? This is hypothesis based upon a couple of pieces of research that I've seen. But when you're looking at diversity in the gut, it makes sense that, yeah, we want to be eating as much of a diverse amount of foods as we possibly can. So could flax and chia and good soluble fibers, even things like inulin and very long chain inulin from artichoke and from asparagus, could these be playing a much bigger role in testosterone production than we actually thought? Now, I'm not saying that you go out and you just do everything you can to eat nothing but fiber because there's clearly a very important role with dietary cholesterol because that gets sucked up into the testes to ultimately produce testosterone as well. So yes, there's a lot of moving pieces here, but when you look at things like even the ketogenic protocol done in a cleaner Mediterranean way, yeah, you're combining some of these things. You're combining good, healthy fish, you're combining healthy eggs, you know, these good, cleaner fats, better levels of dietary cholesterol that are coming in alongside lots of soluble fiber and lots of long chain fibers that really enhance short chain fatty acid production. On that note, a lot of people ask me about probiotics. I'll just make a quick mention here. The probiotic I recommend is called Seed. I put a link down below for those of you that wanna check it out. Now, I'm not saying that Seed is going to, you know, 
do anything magical for you. But what I am saying is it's the one that I would recommend as far as getting a little bit more of the beneficial bacteria in. They have a unique technology with a capsule inside of a capsule. So basically it can survive that hostile like hydrochloric acid within your gut a little bit better to potentially get the bacteria where it needs to go that much better. Uh, also, it's just, they've done a lot of research, and if you know my channel, you know I'm about research. So I just appreciate people and brands that are actually putting their best foot forward with getting the good research out there. So I put a link down below. You can save 15% by using code THOMAS15 if you wanna check them out. And big thank you to Seed for the continued support on this channel as well. Okay, so a lot of what I do is take different research studies that I've seen and formulate my own sort of experiences with them, anecdotal experiences. I test things out. Okay, now again, a lot of times I'm just putting things together, okay? There's no concrete study on this particular subject, but I wanna talk about short chain fatty acids for a second. So soluble fibers, insoluble fibers, whatever, okay? Whatever is contributing to our gut microbiome, mainly soluble fibers, they play a very big role in what are called short chain fatty acids, which I talk about a lot. Short chain fatty acids are like the end result of fiber getting broken down by our bacteria. And we have what are called quote unquote, butyrate producers. Okay, these are certain bacteria that are in our gut that produce more butyrate than others. And based on what we know right now, the microbiome is still, we're just scratching the surface, butyrate producers are very good because butyrate is a short chain fatty acid. Now these short chain fatty acids aren't just fatty acids that live in our colon. These short chain fatty acids send signals to our body. They send signals to our brain, they send signals to various satellite cells within the body. And some of the pretty heavy research out there is surrounding short chain fatty acids and glucose homeostasis. Okay, meaning those short chain fatty acids can send a signal to help regulate our glucose a little bit more, potentially. So a lot of times people think that, okay, maybe we have this effect from the glucose or our blood sugar just because fiber takes a long time to digest. There's the other argument that says, well, it's probably because you're developing more short chain fatty acids that are sending a stronger signal to metabolize glucose better. I'm more inclined to think it's the latter. I think the short chain fatty acids like butyrate, propionate, acetate are very, very, very important. But what does this have to do with potential testosterone levels? Well, if we can improve glucose homeostasis, then we can improve how the cells utilize glucose, okay? If the cell is not utilizing glucose, we could potentially be dealing with some degree of insulin resistance. When we have some degree of insulin resistance, that can affect our testosterone production negatively as well, okay? Because then we aren't only affecting our cells on the surface with what they can take in, but we're also affecting fat that we accumulate. And the fat that we accumulate could potentially have more what is called aromatase enzyme in it, which converts testosterone into estrogen. Okay, then we end up with more estrogen receptors. Okay, it's called estrogen receptor beta, and it's heavily researched. More estrogen receptor beta means poorer GLUT4 translocation. It means that GLUT4 isn't able to get to the surface of a cell membrane as well to take in glucose. So we're coming at it from a different angle then. So by basically not taking care of our gut microbiome, we could potentially be limiting how effective our cells are at using glucose in another way too. And by getting more fat, because we potentially are getting insulin resistant, then we end up triggering lower testosterone production, more estrogen production, and well, more estrogen dominance, which is affecting our glucose homeostasis as well. So it may seem like metabolism and gut microbiome and testosterone and all this are separate pieces, but they all work together. That's why there's literally a term called metabolic hypogonadism, where because we have obesity and because we have so much people being overweight, we deal with this poor function of sexual reproduction. Like it just doesn't work as well. So I'm not saying that fixing your microbiome is gonna fix everything. We just don't have enough research there. But when you start compiling all the different research, it's probably one of the safer ways that we could hypothesize. At least that's what I'm doing. So as always, I'm here to bring you forward thinking. That's what I do. And I'll see you tomorrow.